Good afternoon and welcome to Oregon Sea Grant's Careers in Science Investigations webinar. This is our fifth of a series of webinars intended to connect students like yourselves interested in careers in marine science with professionals working in the field. My name is Lindsay Carroll and I am the Marine Education Coordinator with Oregon Sea Grant and I work out of Hatfield Marine Science Center. Hatfield is, is, is closed right now, unfortunately, but we're very excited to bring you marine education programming virtually. You may ask questions of our presenters today at any time during their presentation. You may do so by using the question and answer box located at the bottom of your screen. It should be labeled Q and A. So go ahead and type those questions in that box as you, as you have them, and we will get to as many questions after their presentations as possible and as time permits. Before we get started, we want to get to know a little bit more about you. So we're going to be using two poll questions to learn more about you. For those of you that have joined us before, you're familiar with these two poll questions. Our first one is asking you to tell us what grade level you are in. So are you in elementary school, middle school, high school, college, or are you an adult? We have about 80% of people who have voted. Just wanna give those last people a chance before we end the poll now. All right, thank you. That was the voice of Kate Goodwin. She is our special projects coordinator. So thank you, Kate. Results are in. We have 10% that are in elementary school, 47% in middle school, 23% in high school, and we have 20% that are adults. Thank you so much. Our next poll question is going to ask you to tell us where you're joining us from. So go ahead and thank you, Kate. So go ahead and let us know if you're joining us from Oregon, the West Coast, not Oregon, the Central US, the East Coast, or are you joining us from outside the US? All right. Thank you, Kate. So it looks like we have 81% coming from Oregon, 9% West Coast, not Oregon, 6% Central US, and 3% East Coast. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. We're very excited to learn a little bit more about you. And so now we're going to transition into our presenters. I'm very excited for our two presenters today because they are both graduate students in the Marine Resource Management Program within the College of Earth, Ocean, and Atmospheric Sciences at Oregon State University. And the reason I'm so excited is because I am an alumni of the Marine Resource Management Program. And it's the program that brought me from Maryland on the East Coast, so you East Coasters, um, to Oregon in 2013. And so I've been here ever since. So um, they are going to let you know about their paths leading to graduate school. And they're also gonna tell you about the different projects you can get involved in even within the same degree, degree program. So without further ado, I would love to introduce our first speaker, Toby Harbison. She is going to tell us her path of unique experiences that led her to graduate school. And then she's gonna tell us a little bit about her current research project on Dungeness crabs. So Toby, go ahead and share your screen and begin your presentation. All right. Thank you very much, Lindsay. I am very happy to be here today and share some of my experiences. I'm going to talk a little bit about the path that led me to my current graduate program in the Marine Resource Management uh, Program at Oregon State. And I'm going to just share a little bit of humble advice and things that I've learned along the way. So um, that's me. Uh, I'm going to talk about, as I said, my career path, what made me want to go to graduate school, life as a graduate student, uh, my current research, which is on Dungeness crab feeding ecology, 
uh, my personal dreams for the future and where I see my own career going. And then again, that humble suggestions and advice that I have for you as students. All right, so my academic career began in high school. Uh, I don't know if anyone remembers Mean Girls, but uh, for me, when I was in high school, I was a part of the International Baccalaureate Program. And this is an ac academic program for high school students that has an international focus. Um, it's a program that happens all around the world. Um, and this program allowed me to kind of get a head start on college, you might say, um, because I was able to go into college with a lot of credits already. Um, so the International Baccalaureate program was awesome for me, but I would say that AP is just as good of an idea when preparing for uh, going to college, and that's advanced placement. So I went to the College of William and Mary, which is in Williamsburg, Virginia. Big transition for me because I'm from California originally. And when I was an undergrad, I had a lot of different ideas about what I wanted to do. Um, I actually started out as an African studies major. Then I switched to botany. Then I switched to English. And eventually I was an American studies major. So. I had a lot of different ideas and um, did a lot of searching before I really figured out what it was that I wanted to do. When I was in undergrad, I had an opportunity to participate in a study abroad program that was about uh, marine resource management. So this is my first foray into marine science. and. This is the island where I lived, South Caicos. I did research on spiny lobster. So I was looking at different habitat types that spiny lobster larvae, little baby spiny lobster live in. Um, and I was actually mapping those habitat types. So um, I drove around a little boat, get to jump out into the water, dive down, and basically record what I found within a marine protected area off of the island of South Caicos. While I was there, I also participated in a public service program teaching locals on the islands how to hunt these lionfish, which are invasive in the Caribbean. So I would hunt lionfish, I would fillet them and cook them in front of locals to show them that um, the fish were edible. I also participated in a program that allowed me to tag sea turtles. So I would actually just swim behind sea turtles, uh, chase them, and um, eventually they would get tired and I would be able to bring them, bring them up onto the boat and I would place these tags on the turtles so that we could learn more about their migration. Had a lot of fun when I was there. Here's a picture of me and some of my friends um, during the study abroad program. Um, something else that I thought about when I was doing this study abroad program was just the dependence of a lot of people around the world on fisheries. And um, this is a picture from Turks and Caicos and it's showing um, hurricane damage. And a lot of places that I was studying, um, where I was studying had, people who were very poor and they really depended on marine resources. So I started thinking about that in Turks and Caicos, a lot of people relied on the conch fishery. And this is a big pile of conch shells from Turks and Caicos. After I graduated from college, I uh, started working as an environmental educator and I was able to work out at the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary in Southeast Alaska. Um, I worked in school garden programs and I also worked in, uh, worked for city government in San Luis Obispo in California. Uh, I started working as an environmental educator um, working for Montana State Parks and there's a little star above me um, and through the Montana State Parks AmeriCorps program, I was trained in natural resource interpretation. 
so how to talk to people about the natural world. And my job was to coordinate all education programs within one region of the Montana State Parks. So I did a lot of campfire programs and field trips and things like that. Did a lot of exploring. Um, this is me on the Continental Divide Trail. Encountered a lot of bears. And my work as a natural resource interpreter took me up to Southeast Alaska. Um, so I'm curious if anyone knows what these are. Maybe we can answer that at the end. When I was up in Southeast Alaska, I did a lot of work in citizen science. So I would take kids and adults on tours where I would actually do data collection. So I did data collection on salmon stream water quality and also uh, did research on humpback whales. So here's a picture of some salmon from Southeast Alaska. These are sockeye salmon. I also was able to work as a naturalist on a sailboat in Maui and out at the Channel Islands National Park and National Marine Sanctuary. Had a lot of fun out there too. Eventually I went back up to Alaska and I took a position as the uh, lead guide for a small cruise ship. So this is the cruise ship that I worked on. Um, it held about 40 passengers, not like the massive cruise ships that you think of. This is more of an adventure oriented cruise ship. And my job was to teach marine science um, and other um, science to tourists, people who were on um, week long trips on the cruise ship. So I got to do a lot of whale watching, a lot of kayaking in front of glaciers. There I am giving a tour. But eventually I realized that I was kind of tired of working with tourists all the time and working with kids a lot, um, that I really wanted to go back to school and actually do science myself instead of talking about science. Um, I enjoyed being an educator, but I really wanted to um, advance my career and be a scientist myself. Um, I absolutely love science, and so um, I decided to go back to school. Um, after a bit of soul searching, um, my career has not been a straight line. I actually spent some time in India, um, became a yoga teacher. When I was in India, I was on the coast and I saw a lot of small scale fisheries in action. Um, I again saw a lot of poverty and dependence on the ocean for food. So these are all things that kind of um, allowed me to figure out what it was that I really wanted to do with my life. I took prerequisite classes at a community college in preparation for graduate school. And eventually I was able to get into Oregon State University for graduate school, which is the program that I'm in now, the Marine Resource Management program. Uh, now here we have a comparison between zombies and grad students. It's true grad school is a lot of work um, and I have seen a few grad students that look like zombies but I would say that it is worth it um, in order to um, make your dreams come true and pursue your goals especially if you want to be a professional scientist. scientist. Um, I was able to work at Hatfield Marine Science Center. This is where I conduct most of my research now. And I conduct research on the benthos, which is the seafloor. And um, I look at organisms that live on top of the seafloor and actually in the sediment that's at the bottom of the ocean. My current project is looking at the feeding ecology of Dungeness crabs. These are Dungeness crabs. It's one of the most important fisheries on the entire west coast, a very economically important fishery. And I've actually been able to continue my research uh, on Dungeness crabs despite the COVID-19 pandemic. So this is me just about a month ago um, doing research on a boat off the coast of Newport, Oregon. 
and I was measuring crabs and collecting crab samples. Uh, for my research, I'm looking at how much and what Dungeness crabs eat. I think that Dungeness crabs might eat a lot of discarded bait or bait that's thrown overboard from the commercial, commercial Dungeness crab fishery. So I want to see how much uh, bait they eat, how many wild prey they eat, and um, how much cannibalism there is out there. Uh, Dungeness crabs eat each other a lot. So I want to see how many other Dungeness crabs they're eating. I also do a lot of mapping. I'm really into maps. I love spatial analysis. I love looking at Google Earth and um, I did a lot of GIS, which is geographic information systems when I was an undergrad. So that's something that I'm continuing to do in grad school as well. When I look towards my future, what I really want to do is work on small scale fisheries management. Um, I want to work on building capacity within developing countries to allow them to manage their fisheries effectively. So um, I want to help people around the world figure out the best ways to keep our oceans healthy and also to have um, food that will support them and be able to make money from this uh, resource around the world. And that was really influenced a lot by my experiences in Turks and Caicos and also the time that I spent in India. Um, about 90% of uh, fish farmers around the world are small scale from small scale fisheries. It's a really important issue. 12% of the world's population depends on fisheries and 90% of those are small scale. About half of the world's fishers are actually women, which is surprising to me. Um, but uh, that's what I want to work on in the future. And if it happens to be in a beautiful place, that doesn't hurt. All right, so here are my humble advice and suggestions. Um, lots of people will tell you it's important to get a good education if you want to be a marine scientist. But there are also a lot of careers that you can do that don't require grad school. Um, so I would just encourage you to uh, figure out what kind of education you need for your specific goals and to think of the world in terms of possibilities. That's what I mean by the abundance mindset. Um, to believe that everything that you want to do um, is possible and um, that everything that you want exists in the world. It's just a matter of going out and getting it or figuring it out. It's really important to ask for what you want and to learn how to overcome setbacks and failures. There will be failures along the way. Um, there will be challenges. Um, that will happen no matter what you do in life. But the most important thing is how you deal with those challenges. Um, and really do what you want um, live by your own rules, be the person that you want to be. And the last one that I threw in there was that sometimes uh, your path or what you want to do in life doesn't really make sense. Maybe you um, take a while to figure out what you want to do, but eventually um, if you keep following your passions, it, it will make sense. Like for me, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. I did a lot of exploring. Um, but uh, now that I look back, I can see that a lot of the experiences that I've had in the past have led to the career path that I'm on now that I'm very happy with. So that is what I have to share with you for today. So happy to take some questions now. Thank you, Toby. Thank you for your presentation and for your humble words of wisdom. I think that's very helpful for them to hear. So we have a question from Sydney kind of on that topic of what was the time gap between undergrad and graduate school for you? I graduated from undergrad in 2011 and I started graduate school in 2019. 
So I spent um, eight or nine years uh, working in natural resource interpretation and environmental education. Very good. Um, thinking of Dungeness crabs, what is the longest crab you've ever encountered? Your longest Dungeness crab? Like the biggest Dungeness crab I've ever encountered? Encountered? Yes. Yeah, largest. That's what I meant. Um, let's see, probably about 220 millimeters, which is like 22 centimeters across. That's pretty big. Pretty big. Have you, so similar vein, we have a question of, from Heather, um, have you ever been pinched and did it hurt? I have been pinched by Dungeness crabs, absolutely. Um, yes, uh, sometimes we get them back to the lab, they're usually still alive and they will fight back. So yeah, I have been pinched. Um, you have to learn how to handle them correctly um, and I've gotten better at it, but sometimes they still get me. I have holes in my clothes, even from uh, the crabs. <laughs> Sounds like you need a special set of field clothes, huh? Yes. <laughs> so thinking back, it looks like some of our participants are commenting on what on that slide of where are we, what are those? So we have some yeah. guests about baleen whales, specifically humpback whales. So do you want to go ahead and reveal the answer to that one? Yes, those are humpback whales and they were bubble net feeding in that image, um, which is where they all worked collectively to catch a bunch of bait at the same time. And that was a picture that I took in Southeast Alaska. Very good. So when studying the seafloor, did you have to learn about the microscopic marine organisms like protists, algae, protozoans, bacteria? Um, yes, that is very important um, to understanding the ecosystem as a whole. Um, it's important to have that kind of um, base knowledge of the organisms that live on the seafloor, although I primarily study um, the macroorganisms um, rather than the microscopic organisms. Very good, thanks, Toby. So a question about your study of broad programs. How did you find them and is there support for that? Yeah, so I found the School for Field Studies um, just through my college's study abroad website. And the School for Field Studies is um, a program that you can participate in regardless of what university you go to. Um, it's affiliated with Boston University, um, but uh, you just have to apply to that program and um, go through an interview process. Um, and that's how I ended up in the School for Field Studies program. There is um, financial support um, there are scholarships that you can apply for in order to be able to participate. I would encourage that. Um, and I also was able to get funding through my home university of William and Mary. So sometimes that's a possibility as well. Thank you for that excellent insight. One last quick question is from Isaac. Which place have you been that has the most diverse sea animals? Hmm. Well, um, I guess every place that I've done marine science work, which would be like the Caribbean, uh, Southeast Alaska, and um, the Channel Islands off the coast of California has very different, but also very um, abundant organisms. So the most diversity, um, I'd probably say would be in the coral reefs that I worked with in uh, Turks and Caicos. But there's a lot of diversity off the coast of California and in Alaska as well. Great, thanks Toby. And thanks for giving us some photos of the beaches and Turks and Caicos and just letting us dream about um, sitting, on, sitting in the sand. So thank you for your presentation. I'm gonna go ahead and transition to our next presenter.
Our next present presenter is Ashley Han, and she's going to tell us about her recent field expedition to a field station in Antarctica. And so she's going to share us the tools and, and partnerships needed to study ocean conditions in a remote location. So go ahead and share your screen and start your presentation. Ashley, thank you. Sure thing. Thanks, Lindsay. And thanks, Toby. That was super neat. Even though we are classmates and friends, it's neat to hear about your your current research. So let's see if this will work. Share my screen. How's that look? Look okay? Yes. Good. Awesome. Great. Okay. So yes, uh, as has already been mentioned, my name is Ashley Han, and like Toby, I am a graduate student in the Marine Resource Management Program here at Oregon State. Uh, you're going to notice uh, that Toby and I definitely have some similarities in our journey, similar interests, uh, and a similar degree at the moment that we're seeking. However, I hope from the combination of our talks, you'll gain how uh, you can kind of make whatever you want of your journey, your education, your experience. It's really what you choose to make of it and the sky's the limits in what you can do. Uh, so today I'm going to focus on the five W's and one H. The five W's and one H being who, what, when, where, why, and how of Antarctic research and constructing an ocean observing system because as has been mentioned, I have spent some time recently in Antarctica as part of my graduate research. I actually uh, spent the entire winter quarter most recently um, in Antarctica, so I'm going to talk about my experiences there, what it's like to do research in Antarctica, uh, and then more specifics about our research in general, which involved constructing this ocean observing system. So before I get into the nitty gritty details of Antarctica, I'm going to tell you all a little bit about my background and how I ended up at Oregon State and then in Antarctica. So like um, Toby, I'm also not originally from Oregon. I'm actually from the East Coast. I grew up in Colston, New Jersey, which was very lucky for me because that meant that all the bays and river systems and oceans of the coastal region were my playground. So I grew up immersed in this environment and fell in love with the ocean and all of the organisms that lived in it. So from a really young age, I was fascinated by the natural world as a whole, but specifically uh, the marine environment. I want to understand uh, why the ocean was blue or why the fish swam away from me and things like that. Uh, when I was a middle school student, our county provided eighth graders the opportunity to apply to a magnet a uh, public high school that specialized in marine science and technology. So if you notice in this photo uh, right here, uh, that's a photo of me at that high school. So uh, you had to apply to get in, but if you were accepted, you were guaranteed, um, similar to how Toby had a specialized path through her, her IB program. Uh, this was a specialized degree that focused on marine science and technology. And then we also required to do ROTC, which is why, Naval ROTC, which is why we're all in those uniforms there. So I applied to that program, was accepted, and then was able to immerse myself in marine science and technology uh, throughout high school. And then when I finished high school, I realized that marine science and the ocean wasn't just something that I was a side passion. It was something that I could truly make into a lifelong uh, pursuit and career goal. So when I graduated high school, I attended college in North Carolina at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington, where I eventually got a bachelor's of science in marine biology. A little different than Toby. I didn't try out a lot of things because I was lucky enough to know right off the bat that marine biology was what I wanted to do. So throughout my four years in undergraduate, uh, I not only enrolled in classes that would hopefully help me uh, excel in marine science, but I also tried to gain as many hands-on experiences as possible uh, in marine sciences. So if you look at these photos here that just popped up, they kind of highlight some of those different opportunities that I've had. So I spent six months studying abroad in Australia and was able to do research on the Great Barrier Reef. I obtained an internship with NOAA and actually was brought out to the West Coast for the first time and lived in Newport, Oregon for a few months out at Hatfield, where I did research on forage fishes, so things like uh, sardines and anchovies and herring, and had my first opportunity to participate in a larger scale long-term uh, research cruise. And then through that same experience, I also was able to present 
in Washington, D.C. at my first national scale conference. I also did, participated in working groups uh, in the Florida Keys to work on quantitative ecology, which is the combination of ecology or sciences and math and melding those two things together to understand a system a little bit more and then sometimes bringing in some policy. And so then I applied those things that I learned in the working group in the Florida Keys to my own personal research on the effectiveness of artificial race, which you can see presented here. After I graduated uh, from undergraduate, I knew I wanted to stick on this path of marine science that I had been on since a young age, but I didn't necessarily want to go to graduate school right away, thought that maybe it would be something I could do in the future. Uh, so I ended up obtaining a job uh, doing marine science education, once again somewhere to Toby. Uh, I worked for a nonprofit um, on Catalina Island, which is one of the Southern Channel Islands off of Southern California. And I was a marine science and outdoor educator, which basically meant that school groups would come out to our facilities for a few days at a time, and I would immerse those groups in the natural environment around them, take them snorkeling, hiking, kayaking into specialized laboratory environments in hopes of helping them understand the different elements of the natural environment a little bit more, and through that understanding, hopefully develop a passion and appreciation for it and turn them into stewards of the environment themselves. So through this experience, I realized that I didn't just love marine science, but I also appreciated the ability to apply the marine research that I had experienced in the past to real world situations. So in this scenario, that included applying marine research to education and outreach uh, programs. And so I did that for a few years. And then this most recent fall, I started graduate school uh, at Oregon State University. And then in December, I headed down to Antarctica per to participate in the Austrial summer field season is what they call it. Here at Oregon State, I'm part of the Bernard Zooplankton Ecology Lab. And so that is a facility at OSU that is led by Dr. Kim Bernard. She is my advisor and we focus on zooplankton ecology. If you had tuned into one of the earlier career science investigation talks by Jamie Ivory in which she discussed plankton as a whole, you would have learned uh, what a plankton is or a zooplankton. So plankton comes from the Greek word drift planktos, which means drifters. So it's any organism in the ocean that while it might be able to swim a little bit, it can't fight against the larger motion of the ocean. It's a drifter. It's at the mercy of the motion of the ocean. And then zoo, kind of like zoo, what do we keep in a zoo? We keep animals there. So a zooplankton is going to be an animal plankton. So we're interested in understanding how zooplankton interact with their environment, what impacts them, and then what role they play in the larger ecosystem. And right now, a lot of the research that our lab group is doing happens to be in Antarctica. So when I went down to Antarctica, I was a representative for the Bernard Zooplankton Ecology Lab as part of a larger interdisciplinary team that was taking a closer look at a particular element of the Antarctic ecosystem. So now I'm going to get more into the nitty gritty of Antarctic research, the who, what, when, where, why, and how. So we'll start off with when do we work in Antarctica? Um, so we work in Antarctica for, we can work there for most of the year. And that kind of goes with where we work as well. So we can work, if you look at this map here on the right hand side, um, there are research stations, permanent research stations that are throughout the entire continent. So each of those little flags with a red name next to it, that re represents a different research station uh, that is occupied by a certain country. Antarctica as a continent is governed by something called the Antarctic Treaty, which is inter an international treaty that essentially says that no country can lay claims to the continent anymore, and that it is a land that has been designated for peace and science. So as a result, that's why when I'm describing most of these places, I'm calling them research stations, because most of the work that is occurring in Antarctica is scientific research. Uh, and as it said on the previous slide, there are over 70 permanent research stations in Antarctica and numerous other field stations that aren't there throughout the entire year. And over 30, 30 countries are represented in Antarctica with people living there all year round, which is pretty neat. But most of the work that occurs in Antarctica does occur during the Austrial summer, which is the summer in the Southern hemisphere. So it's the opposite of us. So during our winter is their summer, which is when I was down there. 
So for the United States, uh, those who participate in research or do work in Antarctica, uh, there are three research stations that they can go to that are a part of what is called the U.S. Antarctic Program. So if you look at this map again, if you look at the uh, lower side of it, there's that gray area where it says Ross Ice Shelf. There's McMurdo Station. Above that, we have the South Pole. And then in that red circle is another area called Palmer Station, which is on the Western Antarctic Peninsula. That's that little strip of land, kind of like a finger sticking out from the continent. And so when I was in Antarctica, I was at the Western Antarctic Peninsula uh, at Palmer Station. And research stations that are at Palmer Station are often very interested in studying the biology or the biological interactions or ecosystem of Antarctica because it's what we call a hot spot of biodiversity, which doesn't actually have to do with the temperature of it. It more so has to do with that there's a high concentration of biology or life in this area, which I'll talk more about in relation to my specific research. So here in this picture, you can see an image of Palmer Station from a boat over the water and a little sleepy leopard seal hanging out on a chunk of ice or burby bit as we call it and then we'll see if this link works um, if it doesn't this will you could just google this later um, and this will take you to an actual live feed of um, the ooh, there we go cool okay it'll, it's a live feed of the research station so right now it is nighttime there because depending on the time of year there's a four to five year time difference between us on the west coast and antarctica um but you can check out the what the uh the station looks like and there's also links to penguin cameras and things of that nature so super neat stuff definitely check that out in the future so now that we know a little bit about where we work in Antarctica and when we work in Antarctica, let's talk about how do we get to Antarctica. Depending on the research station that you're at or the area of the continent you're, that you're on, there's a variety of different forms of transportation that you can take. Uh, at Palmer Station, we're on an island called Anvers Island, and so because of that, uh, we don't have the ability to have cargo planes land there. So all of the people and things that end up in Antarctica uh, at Palmer Station have to come via ships. So this big vessel here, this lovely yellow and orangish red uh, thing in the ocean, that is the research vessel Lawrence M. Gould, or the Gould as we sometimes call it, or LMG. And this is one of the most common forms of transportation to get to Palmer Station for you people participating in the U.S. Antarctic program. So scientists or other individuals will board the Gould in Punta Arenas, Chile, which you can see on that little yellow pin on the map here, that's in the southern tip of South America. And then they'll go up through the Straits of Magellan and out into the ocean, and then they'll cross over this dark blue area of water. That area of water right there is called the Drake Passage or Drake Crossing. And as you can see in this video to the right-hand side, it's a can be a pretty rough area of water. So the Drake Passage uh, is a region of water in which there's no land that sticks out in between um, in this region throughout the entire world. So if you were to go all the way around Antarctica in this area of water, uh, there's no land there. So as a result, there's a lot of space for wind and water energy to build up. So that means you can have really big waves and really, really strong winds. So it's one of the most treacherous crossings in the world. Uh, and it's, very, it's a very common place for people to get seasick and a lot of people dread it. It takes around five, but it can also be viewed as an adventure. That's kind of how I viewed it. Uh, and it takes around five days to get from Punta Arenas to Palmer Station. Uh, but once you get there, you're greeted with this lovely place. This is Palmer Station. Um, when I was there, in the Austrial summer or most recent winter. We had around 44 people at the station. Uh, and then in the winter, because this is a year round facility, there are normally around 20 people who will be there in the their winter, our summer as well. So now I want you to think about who those 44 people are or those 20 people if we're in the winter. Who do you think can work in Antarctica? Um, and I'm actually gonna stop talking here for a second. I want you all to, to you put your thinking caps on and I want you to answer that question. So a little poll should have just popped up that says who can work in Antarctica. So I want you to check all of the individuals that you think apply to this scenario. Who do you think can work in Antarctica? 
undergraduate students, so college students, scientists, artists, plumbers, or firefighters. Check all that you think apply and all who you think can work in Antarctica. How are we looking, Kate? About 68% have voted so far. There's a lot to think about, so it might be a little longer. You gotta give everyone some time. <laughs> and if some people may be joining as a group, and so there may be discussions going on. This among, is true. Yeah. You might have to have a vote of sorts, or maybe everyone <laughs> could pick their, you're allowed to, it's multiple choice, so you, could, you can pick multiple options if you'd like. <laughs> it looks like we're holding steady, so I'm going to close the poll awesome. in three, two, one, boop. Okie dokies. So we have, for our poll, drum roll, da -da -da -da, we have who can work in Antarctica, and remember this was multiple choice, so you could answer to multiple of these, say they were correct. 91% of people said undergraduate students, 100% said scientists. 61% said artists, 58% said plumbers, and 52% said firefighters. That was super awesome, everyone. Thank you all for participating and putting your thinking caps on, maybe having some group debates if you are in a group. Uh, that was a bit of a trick question, actually, because all of those people can work in Antarctica. Um, and sometimes people may wear multiple of those caps at one time. So who can work in Antarctica? All those people, scientists, undergraduate students, graduate students, artists, plumbers, um, firefighters, and so many other individuals with diverse skills and backgrounds work in Antarctica. Be while we mentioned earlier that uh, most of the stations in Antarctica are based off of research, that doesn't mean that's all that occurs there. And in order to keep these facilities up and running, to allow scientists to do the cutting edge science that they'd like to do, uh, and to keep everyone happy and healthy, you need to have a diverse array of people. So while I was at Palmer Station in Antarctica, we had plumbers, chefs, firefighters, mechanics, carpenters, uh, journalists, photographers, and a wide, undergraduate students, graduate students like myself, and a wide array of different types of scientists. It wasn't just one sort of scientist. There were people who studied all sorts of different things and everyone had their own specialty. If you look in the photo in the upper right-hand corner, you can kind of see an example of that diverse array of skills and specialties uh, in this photo. So uh, this group right here are some of the people who are on the research team that I was a part of. We're currently in a silver box uh, kind of looks jail-like now that I'm looking at it, but what it actually is is what we call a remote power module. So this is a power unit that we constructed on an island in Antarctica that was powered by solar panels as well as wind turbines and then had rechargeable batteries that you can see us uh, surrounding in the photo. And then that in turn can power an oceanographic device uh, that we have deployed in an area that normally wouldn't have access to a power grid. And so this system that we have here, this remote power module, was actually designed by the person in, in the blue jacket there. That's Hank, and he almost invented this system with some of his co-workers in Alaska. And totally different from Hank, the person in the gray, he is Josh, and he's a physical oceanographer. Uh, he already has his PhD and is a professor from New Jersey. And then the other two women in the red and orange, uh, those are Katie and Jackie, and they are also graduate students like myself, who you can see in the bottom right corner of that photo, but we all have our own specialties in regards to science. I was kind of part of our team as the biological oceanographer. I was there to help uh, bring in the specialty of the Bernard Zooplankton Ecology Lab in that I was helping us learn more about the zooplankton of the waters, whereas Katie knew how to operate equipment like gliders and Jackie focused on the physics. So very diverse team, diverse skills, both in the scientists that are there as well as the people as a whole. And it really requires uh, this diversity for us to succeed throughout the year. So really, really important. So regardless of if you're interested in science or maybe you, just, you like science, but you don't think you wanna do a career in it, that's okay. You can still go really awesome places and support scientific endeavors, which is awesome. So now I'm gonna finish up this talk by answering the what, the final W of our scenario here. And I'm going to focus on the research that I 
was a part of while in Antarctica. So what is an ocean observing system, which is a tool that I've been mentioning a few times uh, that we utilized in what we were studying in Antarctica. So an ocean observing system is when scientists and other individuals uh, deploy oceanographic equipment in a particular region to understand and predict what happens in that region. And then you can apply that knowledge that you gain to other systems in hopes of focusing really heavily in one region to have a larger comprehension of things and possibly make predictions in the future. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, where we are in Antarctica, we'll look back at this map that we have on the left hand side. Uh, I was at Palmer Station, which is on the Western Antarctic Peninsula. I want you all to think for a few seconds, what did I say was really special about the Western Antarctic Peninsula? Why were, did, were there research stations there? Okay, a few seconds to think about that. And if you were thinking because it was a biological hotspot, because there was a lot of life concentrated around the Western Antarctic Peninsula, you were correct. So the team that I was a part of, which you can see in the upper right hand corner, that photo shows our team having some fun, once again, really diverse team with people who have a specialty in penguins or operating fancy equipment or identifying organisms or doing fancy mathematics, lots of diverse skills and backgrounds and experience levels as well. Uh, this was my first time in Antarctica, but there are people in that photo who have been to Antarctica uh, more than 40, 40 years, which is pretty wild. They went down there when they still had wooden boats taking people to research stations, which is pretty neat. Uh, so our team, we were interested in studying that biological hotspot we were talking about, and we wanted to know what drives biology in this region. What is creating this biological hotspot? So if you look at this map on the right bottom side of the screen, you'll notice that we've placed this black squiggly circular shape around this region of water. Uh, so this right here is what we call Palmer Deep Canyon. It is a region of water of the ocean off of the Western Antarctic Peninsula, right off of where that little green triangle is, which is where Palmer Station is. And this region uh, is, as we mentioned, an area of particularly high biodiversity, so lots of organisms here. And it's also called Palmer Deep because in this region, you might notice from the numbers on the map, but it is very deep here. We have what we call a submarine canyon, which is named Palmer Deep Canyon. So we were interested in understanding what physically, chemically, uh, ocean, in the ocean was occurring here on a really small time scale, so like every second almost, what was occurring here and how that influenced the biology uh, and what was driving the biology in this region. So in order to answer this question, along with having a really amazing diverse team with lots of skills and experiences, we had to implement our own ocean observing system. And so here is just an example of some of the tools and equipment we utilize to construct this ocean observing system, to go through some of them really quick. The video playing in the upper left-hand corner, that is a mooring that we deployed in this Palmer Deep region. We deployed three moorings, one of which that is actually still out there and will be out there for an entire year. Uh, we went out on boats and we towed things like nets that you can see in the center photo here to actually catch some of those living organisms, that biology we were interested in understanding we towed nets and then we studied that biology a little more. You can see in the bottom left hand corner photo. We also towed other things behind the boat, like this equipment here. You can see in the upper right hand corner photo that is something called an acrobat that can tell us a uh, lot, give us live readings of things like the temperature and salinity and chlorophyll levels or oxygen content of the water column where we're going. And it kind of dives up and down like this through the water column. Really, really neat. Uh, you can see this photo in between the two images on the boat. Uh, this is the outside of that remote power module that I had described earlier. You can see the wind turbines and solar panel on it. Uh, so we had been inside that earlier. And if you look far off into the distance in the snow, there's a little white pole sticking up. And that is actually the equipment that this remote power module is supposed to be powering. That is what we call an HF radar site. And that tells us things about the surface currents and what's happening on the surface of the water, uh, which is a really important thing to understand. And then finally, in the bottom right hand corner, there is a video of a glider. Uh, so a glider is an autonomous underwater vehicle uh, that we can deploy into different systems and then it can be remotely piloted 
by people. These our pilots were actually all the way in New Jersey, uh, and they could tell it things to do, and then we could send it out into the water. And while it's going throughout the water column, it could gather loads and loads of data for us so we could understand this system a little bit more. So this is just a little snapshot of some of the tools that we utilize to construct our ocean observing system. We did loads of other things like tag penguins and um, go out on the vessel with other sources of equipment um, and things of that nature. But just to provide you a little snippet of the really neat research that we were doing there, what we were studying and what an ocean observing system is. So with that, uh, I hope that you all learned a little bit more about the who, what, where, when, why, and how of Antarctic research and understand what an ocean observing system is a little bit more. I'd like to say thank you to everyone and then open the floor up to any questions if anyone has them. Thank you for taking us to Antarctica, Ashley. <laughs> Fantastic. No um, thank you everyone. Um, Thank you for everyone for uh, sticking it out with us. We're gonna probably do two questions, um, but feel free to type in your questions in the question and answer box. Um, and we will submit those questions to Ashley and she'll, get, she'll answer those for you and we'll post those on our website. So we'll take two quick questions. Um, one of them I'm sure a lot of people are thinking is from Lauren, what was the coldest temperature you saw Ooh, uh, good in Antarctica? Question. Good question. So um, I have to give some background of this. I was in the Western Antarctic Peninsula, so that region where I was was actually not in the Antarctic Circle, so it's warmer there and it's also on the ocean, which can give it a little bit more irregular weather, and I was there in the summer. So on average, it was around like 30 degrees Fahrenheit uh, when I was there, but it did get below freezing. Um, so it was, it was warmer than I thought it would be and warmer than I think most people think it is, but that is just where I was. The rest of the continent can get a lot colder. Very good. And one more quick question is, how much time did you spend at sea? So maybe I'm thinking they're talking about how much time were you at the field station? Yeah, so I left for Antarctica from the United States in the end of December. And then we spent the five days in the crossing. We actually spent New Year's in the middle of the Drake Passage, which was really, really neat. And then I came back to the United States in the end of March. So um, like almost three months, two to three months I was there. That must have been quite the experience. It was. It was a really amazing adventure. I learned a lot. Very good. Well, thank you so much, Ashley, for your fantastic presentation of what it's like to do research in Antarctica. Um, so as I said, uh, let me go ahead and share my screen again, actually. All right, my friends. So. To wrap up, um, we would love you to fill out our brief survey. Um, you can um, access this survey uh, if Kate can drop that link into our chat box, which is separate from our question and answer box. You may either click the link or copy and paste that link into your web browser. Uh, we also lear learned some new functions with Zoom. So actually, if you once you leave this meeting, uh, you'll be prompted to fill out the webinar then. So you have two options, copy and paste and click, or you can wait until after uh, we leave the session. So we'd love your feedback. Thank you in advance for that. Um, also feel free to fill in any of those last minute questions in the question and answer box. As I started to mention before, we are gonna go ahead and work with our two presenters here and get as many of your questions answered as possible. And then we will post those answers along with the recording of this webinar on our careers, career day webpage. And so that webpage is listed here. So if Kate wants to drop that link into our chat box um, for you to access, that would be fantastic. Um, and so finally, we encourage you to register for all of our, for, for our future webinars. You can learn more at our Career Day website. Uh, coming up next week, we on May 27th, excuse the 27, 270, that's May 27th at 4 p.m., we are going to feature Erica Fru, who is a fisheries biologist with NOAA. And, she, and she's gonna tell us about how she and her team use those autonomous underwater vehicles that Ashley talked about on worldwide research cruises to learn more about ocean species and habitats. So if you're, you've been waiting to hear about someone who uses underwater technology as part of their job, this is the webinar for you. 
We're also going to hear from Alexa Kaunaki. She's a graduate student within the Fisheries and Wildlife Program at Oregon State University. And so she's going to tell you about how her path, a little bit about her path as well, leading up to graduate school, and how through her research, she is trying to understand the population and health and habitat use patterns of common bottlenose dolphins off of California. So for those of you that may have missed out on that marine mammal themed webinar previously, this is your chance to uh, dive into some marine mammal focused research and learn from someone who's working in the field. So I wanna say thank you again to our two presenters, Toby and Ashley for their fantastic insight, uh, the paths that they traveled leading to grad school, as you're probably noticing, it's very windy and that's okay. Um, and all about their work, uh, their research within the Marine Research Man Management Program at OSU. So thank you for your presentations. Thank you participants for joining. We hope to see you at a future webinar. And for now, have a great even evening. Thank you. <laughs>